with today's busy lifestyle, it's easy to become stressed and tired, but the right multivitamin can help you stay performing at your best. Try the DS range. Designed to help support your active lifestyle, DS Sport has the right combination of vitamins and minerals to give you the extra energy you need to perform at your best. Plus, it's available in sachets for on-the-go convenience. For the energy you need to tackle your busy lifestyle, try the new look DS range. This has been Medifax for DS24. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Wish Cycling Interest Group second webinar of the year. My name is Dr. Megan Dempster. And tonight, um, we're going to be joined by Dr. Bert Seeley, who will be discussing the overtrainings or overtraining syndromes. Um, and he'll be discussing this with sports physicians, Dr. Marcel Yurst and Dr. Jared Van Zadem. Um, so, you know, last time we were introduced to Dr. Jared Van Zadem, but Dr. Marcel Yurst, he's currently working as a sports and exercise medicine physician at SEMLI, which is the Sports Exercise Medicine and Lifestyle Institute at the University of Pretoria. He serves as a part-time lecturer for the sports medicine program at Pretoria University. His previous work includes being the Varsity Cup Rugby Tournament doctor. He's worked as the medical doctor at numerous sporting events, including Super Rugby, franchise cricket and multi-day cycling races. He did his undergraduate medical school training at Stellenbosch University. He then completed his MSc in sports medicine with cum laude at the University of Pretoria. And during this period, he did research in the area of endurance events um, medicine and published a research article on chronic prescription medication use in endurance runners. He is also an avid triathlete, trail runner, and mountain biker, although unfortunately he still rides a hardtail. So thank you so much to our WISH sponsor, Asino Lita, who always makes these events possible with an educational grant. Um, any questions that you do have following the discussion, can you please put in the Q&A tab? And these will then be addressed at the end in the discussion. And then for anyone looking to join the WISH Cycling Interest Group, Please get in touch with the WISH administrator, Nadine Peterson. Over to you, Marcel. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Megan, and welcome, everybody. It's awesome to be part of this group. So it's my privilege to introduce tonight uh, Bert Selye, who is a Belgian national. He obtained his PhD in clinical exercise physiology in 2015 at the University of Ghent in Belgium. In this period, um, Bert found particular links in training and uh, physiological adaptations between patients suffering from certain muscular and metabolic diseases and elite athletes. After obtaining his PhD, he continued as a lecturer um, in exercise physiology at Ghent University and currently is working as a senior researcher at uh, the University of Pretoria at Semli. Bert's passion is to train future sports scientists in physiological testing and coaching. And Bert has been coaching elite uh, cyclists, triathletes, and runners since 2012. Bert and I have had many hours of conversations about training um, and overtraining and training strategies over the past few weeks. And with the combination of the Tour de France's past weekend, we thought it would be interesting to have a chat about the physiological demands of riding a grand tour and the fine line between training so hard for extended periods of time and the risk of over overtraining. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Bert, who will be taking us on a ride of his presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. First of all, thank you for uh, having me um, uh, and to give a talk about this topic. I hope everyone is able to see my screen by now, because otherwise we might have a little problem. Uh, OK, I see thumbs up. That's wonderful. <laughs> OK, uh, so thank you for the organizing committee uh, uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. Um, I must say that my scientific background is um, um, partly in overtraining syndrome, but I have just experienced a lot of 
um, uh, problems with training slash overreaching slash overtraining um, in my supervision or coaching of promising young and elite athletes. And that's actually where I wanted to talk about uh, uh, tonight. And uh, yeah, today is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting you from Belgium because I, um, I got back to uh, my home country for a vaccination uh, before getting back to South Africa. So I miss South Africa a little bit, but today I'm lucky because it's also uh, uh, today that um, it is our national day. Uh, so uh, wait, I just, uh, yep. Okay, our national day. So everybody's here uh, eating fries, drinking beers, but uh, I'm still sober because I wanted to, uh, to be fresh for this presentation. Uh, so yeah, tonight uh, on my behalf, if you have a beer in the house or you, you still have the opportunity to have some chips, it's our national dish, please uh, um, enjoy it very much. Okay, uh, tonight uh, the presentation will be about pushing the limits and beyond, and I'll try to start um, in the outline of this presentation uh, to, to uh, give an indication of the demands of a grand tour, uh, which I will try to combine with uh, uh, the anthropometric and physiological profile and training schedule that uh, normal elite riders have who compete in grand tours, but also in, in, in big classics. Uh, uh, after that, I'll try to, to uh, combine training over training syndrome, first of all, with the neuroimmunological disturbances if you overreach and overtrain, and secondly, also with the intramuscular disturbances that could be present in a case of overreaching, non-functional overreaching and overtraining. Uh, later on, we will also get a bit deeper into polarized versus stressful training models and the link between both. And um, then I'll try to uh, give you a testimonial of one of my athletes. He's actually South African, more naval Niekerk. And uh, he, will, uh, he made a little video because uh, this night he has a prologue in the Tour de Alsace, so he could not join us live, but he was, uh, he was able to make a video to give a little testimonial because when I started coaching him, he was clearly overtrained or uh, dysfunctionally overreached. And um, I thought it was uh, also interesting to share with you the point of view of the athlete uh, in this presentation. Later on, I'm, I'm very curious uh, to, to, uh, to discuss uh, with you guys uh, or, or to, uh, to answer some questions, but also uh, um, to, to have your view on this topic, because I know there will be a lot of, of people uh, who know a lot about this topic too. So it will be very interesting to discuss uh, with you as well. So, um, First of all, I, I, I would like to, to dig a little bit deeper into the nostalgia of the Tour de France. And as you can see in general, the, the, the Grand Tours, uh, uh, the, the overall average speed has increased a lot throughout the years. But this is not only due to uh, uh, the fact that riders have been uh, coached or supervised or uh, um, like uh, a lot better, but it has also to do with uh, other things. The first Tour de France actually was a sort of an adventure ride, you know. Um, uh, less than 10% of the roads were paved. Uh, the first stages of that Tour de France were longer than 300 k's, sometimes 400 k's, and this, the team tactics were completely different. Uh, people just had to reach uh, um, uh, the, the finish line, and uh, the first who crossed the finish line was the winner. It was simple as that. And sometimes it was also in the newspaper reported that someone did not had to did not have to jump off his bike, and that was actually already great news on a, on a mountain stage. So uh, as you can see, drinking wine or drinking beer, uh, having a smoke on the bike is something in those days that was, uh, um, yeah, that was occurring quite, quite frequently. Uh, I can't see Primoz Roglic or Tadej Pogacar now uh, seeing having a smoke or having a, a glass of wine uh, during a mountain stage actually. So it has evolved a lot. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the, a lot of advancements have been made in, in roads and uh, in infrastructure, but also in bike infrastructure, and that has changed the Tour de France a lot. And then, uh, of course, uh, the, the scientific supervision and coaching of athletes right now has improved a lot as well. But what I experienced is that the, the layer of athletes that is not just there and racing in pro-continental teams or youth or promising cyclists, they have not yet 
uh, the, the opportunity to have a scientific uh, guidance in their career. And there um, I have seen that overtraining, overreaching is quite prevalent um, actually. The physiological demands, this is a study from Van Erp who did his PhD study, um, uh, a case study of a climber and a sprinter who uh, rode four grand tours. And as you can see, 20% um, of a grand tour or around 20% is actually ridden in the, uh, uh, the power zone four and five. And that zone is actually from 90 to 120% of the functional threshold power they have to pedal. So 20% is above 90% of the functional threshold power they have to pedal for a climber. But when we, when we compare that with a sprinter, the zone one is quite comparable, but the sprinters have to pedal around 30% uh, above zone one, uh, so at zone four or zone five of their functional threshold power, which is actually a lot. And if you see then for a sprinter during a, a time trial or a mountain stage, MT and TT uh, in this slide, you can see that he is suffering a lot during those stages. And those are the stages that he actually needs to recover for a next sprint. So actually for a sprinter, a grand tour is, uh, is very hard in terms of intensity. And of course, we need to ask ourselves like a grand tour, uh, uh, how long is the recovery time after a, a grand tour? When can we start again training? And, and when is the recovery period has, has been sufficient for the athlete? The physiological demands of a grand tour these guys are um, like consuming 25.4 up to 32.4 mega joules energy expenditure daily. And uh, that runs up to 40 mega joules in, in mountain stages. So that is quite a lot. Um, uh, so in um, like a few years ago, there was a scientist, Jürgen Drup, who actually was very interested in the fact that, okay, they have a very high energy expenditure. Is their energy intake sufficient to counteract that? Will their body weight not be reduced during or after that grand tour? And as you can see here, a lot of um, like professional teams have been uh, uh, doing a good job because the body weight uh, actually got really balanced. Uh, um, so the energy intake was quite well balanced to the energy expenditure for those cyclists. Well, the world-class cyclist physiological and anthropometric profile, uh, of course, they are very lean, especially the climbers. They are very lean. They have a BMI below 18 uh, um, and they have less than 10% body fat. Uh, the uh, power output maximally is 400 to 600 watts at an incremental exercise test. And of course, for uh, the climbers, it's especially important to, uh, to, to have a closer view of the power output maximal um, uh, divided on their body weight. So the, ra the ratio is important for those athletes. And there we can see that these have a score of 6.5 to 8 watt per kilogram. Their view to max, of course, is also very high for these Grand Tour riders, especially relative to their body weight. Now the training schedule, this is from a study BIA et al. And uh, the training schedule of a world-class cyclist is an average five to eight times per week, 60 to 360 minutes per training. And the training background uh, uh, during youth or, or junior stages where, when they, before they become professional cyclists is five to up to 30 years. But actually these are average numbers. We don't know anything about uh, what the real uh, um, training schedule looks like for a lot of cyclists and there are different ways. So the crucial question is how to train and how to prepare athletes for, for, for such a grand tour for, or for other uh, uh, competition. That is the crucial question, especially um, when uh, we take overreaching functional and dysfunctional overreaching slash overtraining into account. So the perfect periodization plan for a grand tour, um, but also we can take this broader for, for runners, for cyclists, for endurance sporters, um, is as a coach, you need to make a plan. And that plan starts with actually the assessment of the initial level of the athlete. So before starting to train, uh, when an athlete um, knocks on my door, the first thing I always do is actually um, try to assess condition uh, based upon an exercise test. 
with view to max testing, uh, uh, lactate measurements, and so on and so on. And that is always the basic uh, before starting to uh, coach an athlete because you want to to uh, get a bit more knowledge about the strong points. You, 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 as a coach, you still want to tweak and the weak points, you actually still want to improve a little bit. So a, a basic test is always the basic point of, 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 of coaching an athlete uh, professionally. Then when you start training, I think it's very important to be aware that recovery is as important as training. And recovery is also matched on the type of training you provide. For example, if you give intense training stimuli, if you give high intensity interval stimuli, you need to be aware that recovery uh, in some cases needs to be longer. So we will get back uh, to that later in the presentation, but uh, right now I already want to stretch that point. Because what you want to achieve as a, as a coach with uh, an athlete is super compensation. And in the next graphic, this is actually clear because the initial level, you know you are overreaching an athlete during, for example, a microcycle of three weeks. You know you are actually stretching uh, uh, the body of the athlete you're supervising or coaching. But after those three weeks, recovery is very important. In one week as well, if you give a training schedule for, for one week, recovery in that week needs to be well adjusted to the type of training you give and the order of training uh, during that week that you, you, you provide them. So the actual aim of um, a coaching schedule is training, functionally overreach, then start a recovery because then the super compensation will be there and you start at the higher initial level than uh, um, the training schedule four weeks before. That is how you work and that is how you try to achieve a higher level. Of course, there's a thin red line in coaching uh, young and elite athletes. Um, we will come to that at the next slide because uh, this is the fitness fatigue model and model, sorry. And the, the taper is very important because that recovery week we see here, um, maybe I can use my um, cursor. So the recovery week we see here, what is actually happening there is the training stress and fatigue is decreasing and because as a, as a result of that, the performance will increase. So also the last one up to two weeks before uh, your athlete has a, has a big goal, a big aim in the season, you'll try to taper. But also when you had a micro cycle of training, you need to lay a recovery period in your training schedule. That is uh, a very important. If you don't do that, if you don't take recovery into account, you can have um, like this downward spiral. So this is what we showed before uh, with a, a, a good recovery after some training stimuli where you try to reach super compensation after super compensation. This is when it goes wrong. This is when an athlete gets, for example, four interval trainings a week, very intense, not enough recovery. And then you can get into a downward spiral of non-functional overreaching. So the way you overreach your athlete is non-functional. So if that continues for weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years, the thin red line with overtraining syndrome can be crossed. And if you have overtraining, it will take a longer time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months to recover before an athlete is back at this initial level. And that is what I want to talk about because uh, up to now I had three athletes. Um, you will hear one of them. Um, I thought it was appropriate to, to pick the South African athlete to give uh, a sort of a testimonial for you guys. But up to now, I think I had 50% of promising athletes knocking on my door when we did an exercise test. Um, it's very difficult to, um, to assess overtraining. Um, and there we will uh, start a discussion later on with, with, uh, with, uh, with Marcel and with Jared maybe, but it's very difficult to diagnose overtraining syndrome, uh, but you can, you can see some things in an exercise test. And I had already 50% of my promising athletes that have been overtrained when they knocked at my door to start training. So the first thing I told them is, okay, you don't have to pay me, uh, put your bike aside and just rest for a few weeks and then we will reassess before starting to train again. And based upon literature, 
uh, has been said that around 30% of young athletes and elite athletes have experienced overreaching or overtraining syndrome at least once. And I think um, uh, with, with our field, we need to uh, improve that number because um, we cannot afford young cyclists to be uh, um, burned down before they actually can build out a good career. So as I said before, in my opinion, optimal training is the same as an optimal recovery. So functional overreaching is perfect because then you actually know what you're doing as a coach. You, you also have your um, signals to monitor the behavior of your athlete, heart rate, uh, rate of perceived exertion, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know that after a heavy training block, you need to have a heavy recovery block before uh, you will reach the super compensation. But if you cross the line and you uh, go into the downward spiral of non-functional overreaching and overtraining syndrome, it can be too late quite quickly. Before, um, uh, so starting to uh, explain a little bit what overtraining actually is physiologically, maybe it's good to have a little recital about the autonomous nerve, nervous system. So as you all know, we have the ortho and parasympathetic um, autonomous nerve pathways where when you start training or exercising it's a sympathetic uh, nerve activity that will cause an increase in heart rate an increase in cardiac output uh, a general vasoconstriction uh, and so on and so on also glycogen is being converted to glucose because glucose is a, a very important fuel basic uh, metabolite to uh, be converted into energy or atp Equally important, the parasympathetic activity after a training that makes sure that the recovery is taking place in a proper way. So for example, uh, the fact that glucose is resynthesized to glycogen in the muscle and the liver, liver is very important after exercise. Uh, for example, uh, the, the heart rate that decreased to have a good rest, um, the digestion of your food, of your carbohydrates uh, post-training is also very important. So both systems, are uh, balanced, are well balanced in a proper training and recovery period. And uh, of course, the sympathetic division works via the release of acetylcholine via the hypothalamus, uh, pituitary gland, adrenal gland axis. So when acetylcholine um, is released in the sympathetic nerve division, the adrenal medulla will release epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, for sympathetic activity and acetylcholine will be released for the parasympathetic activity. Now, uh, exercise, first of all, um, of course, activates, as just said, uh, the sympathetic nerve fiber, but also at the same time, the neuroendocrine system will be activated. And via the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal gland axis, acetylcholine is decreased, uh, sorry, is released, I uh, apologize, and cortisol has been released into the body. And that has an important um, impact on the immune system because cortisol is actually um, stimulating uh, the, the, the movement of immune cells to different parts in the body. So when you have a proper uh, uh, training stimulus and a proper physical activity in daily life, your immune system will be uh, uh, improved after training. And um, this is what we see here. I think um, this is quite similar to the, to the same figure we, we've had about training, recovery and super compensation. Actually, this graphic is, 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 is in a similar way. When you start exercising, the cortisol levels will be high. Your immune cells will be, actually you can compare it with soldiers. Soldiers who leave the barracks to be placed at the frontier to defend the country. This is exactly the same what happens, a one condition, if the recovery period is also appropriately uh, linked to the training uh, you've actually uh, given or the stimuli you've given to your athlete. And then actually the improvements in the immune function, acute and chronic are quite significant. Now, if you have good training and good recovery, you have good chronic adaptations. If you have bad training due to decreased recovery, what the athlete actually needs, this can lead to chronic stress. And in this um, graph, you can see that 
quite nicely. So the effects of acute exercise and acute stress are quite the same, but acute exercise can lead to the beneficial effects of chronic exercise, like an increased lung volume, improved vascular health, increased plasma, blood volume, and so on, etc., etc. But if the recovery is not sufficient, then it can also lead to chronic stress with uh, a lot of chronic adaptations, which are actually quite bad for the athlete. For example, increased cell death, decreased volume of brain, reg brain regions, suppression of growth factors, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in the 90s, there was actually a scientist, Salier, that spoke of a general adaptation syndrome. So for example, in the first phase of an overtraining, you will have a sort of a buildup resistance against uh, a stressor. And the stressor in this case is, of course, training. That is OK if you can adjust. You have a proper recovery, and you have this super compensation also in your immune system. And then you will recover well, and your body will be well resistant to the next training stimuli or next training block. Of course, if you get into, the, um, into this zone of distress and exhaustion, then this is actually one of the explanations of overtraining syndrome and overreaching. So first of all, you can have a sort of a sympathetic overtraining syndrome, which can eventually lead to a parasympathetic syndrome. And the difference between both is that in the one case, you have an increased stressing heart rate, you have an increased stress, you have restless legs and so on. And this will eventually end or evolve up to the end stage overtraining syndrome parasympathetic syndrome that um, is recognized by a decreased maximal heart rate, a faster heart rate recovery, hyperglycemia during exercise because your glycogen resynthesis is not happening, decreased maximal plasma lactate, and decreased catecholamines. And these are things that you can actually see in an exercise test. Of course, an exercise test is not um, like a 100% diagnostic tool for overtraining syndrome, but there are certain markers that you need to be aware of being a coach or an exercise physiologist that could lead into the direction of the fact that your athlete is overreached or overtrained. Um, so again, if the HPA axis is responding normal, the cortisol um, has a sort of a negative feedback loop system uh, where then it inhibits the hypothalamus and pituitary gland to release acetylcholine. If that is a if advanced overreaching is present in the athlete, the whole negative loop feedback system is disturbed in this case. What are now the physiological manifestations of overtraining syndrome? Um, and I refer to the, to the manuscript of Lemur et al. in 2014. Well, first of all, um, of course, it's difficult to include overtrained um, cyclists or runners into a study because the, diagnos the diagnosis of those uh, cyclists and runners is difficult. And it's also non-ethical to include them in studies. So what they did is they overreached a group of um, uh, sporters and they compared it with acute fatigue and a control group. And as you can see, the maximal oxygen uptake was decreased post overreaching training compared to the other groups, combined with a decreased cardiac output. And this decreased cardiac output was also um, seen on a decreased maximal heart rate. Um, and also, of course, the catecholamines and the cortisol levels were, low, were lower in the functional over, overreached group. So these are all signs of um, an overtraining or dysfunctional overreaching in athletes. And what is quite interesting on, this is like a, a typical graphic uh, you will have on a view to max incremental test. You can see that athlete B that was functionally over, overreached that the heart rates during every step in a three minute protocol step test were actually lower and the maximal heart rate was not reached compared to pre uh, overreaching uh, training uh, uh, program. So that is, I think, quite interesting to, 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 like, to, to take with you when you test or uh, monitor athletes in the future. 
A second explanation, which of course coincides with the um, autonomous nerve, uh, um, uh, sorry, the autonomous nerve system disbalance and also the immune system uh, uh, disturbances, this coincides with that because what actually happens in your muscle when you exercise is your glycogen is degraded to glucose because glucose is a very important uh, preliminary uh, metabolite to then go on into glycolysis and Krebs cycle and then it's converted into ATP or energy. When you rest, when you recover, it is very important that your glycogen in your muscle and your liver and liver, sorry, that those storages are re replenished again in the recovery period. So the recent thesis of glycogen is very important in the recovery period. And actually, when that does not happen sufficiently, it's already a first marker of a lot of problems. And uh, glycogen is, of course, resynthesized via blood glucose taken up by glut fear transporters. And then those glucose is actually then um, converted into glycogen again. Now, to combine the immune system and the intramuscular problems, we of course have seen that pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines especially have increased while the pro-inflammatory has de have decreased in when you have a proper training stimulus and a proper recovery. Well, intramuscular, uh, and the intramuscular uh, beneficial effects when you have a, a good training and a proper training stimulus with a good recovery is the, the fact that your mitochondria are increasing, that your capillary density is increasing, that your glycogen synthesis is happening properly, and that your protein synthesis is also increased. When you have an overtraining, excessive training, sometimes also combined with an unhealthy diet, that will also become clear with the testimonial of my athlete, then it can go the other way around. Then protein synthesis um, is not happening. Glycogen synthesis is not happening properly because you didn't take into account or recovery periods were not taken into account in the training schedule. And for example, after a day of hard training, the second day there's again a hard training while the glycogen storage is not replenished enough. So then those things are happening uh, intramuscularly, especially when you do that for weeks and weeks and months and months uh, um, like weeks of intense training uh, without sufficient recovery. So then you, you will have muscle atrophy, your view to max uh, will have been decreased and your maximal heart rate will also be decreased as we discussed before. The intramuscular, um, what does happen is when you give intense training and what I maybe want to explain a little bit better is when you have um, a high exercise intensity, you actually consume a lot of carbohydrates. And when you consume a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of your um, glycogen content intramuscular, but, but also, but also, um, uh, sorry, but also, um, um, uh, sorry, I, I lost a little bit. So also uh, the carbohydrates uh, glycogen content in your muscle and also in your level, liver has been decreased, the heavier your exercise intensity is. So with heavy exercise and moderate exercise, the glycogen content uh, has decreased more than you do, for example, in endurance training. And this is, I think, key to understand when you coach athletes and you give a certain interval training where high intensity is included in the training, you need to exchange with uh, light training uh, or endurance training the day after such a training. Because if you do this day after day, the glycogen content will not be replenished enough. And then a lot of things will happen with membrane damage, with uh, free radicals in the muscle, and then a sort of a, a degradation of the muscle function and the metabolic functions of the muscle will occur. This is actually, uh, two, these are actually two studies to, uh, to, to uh, look a bit closer in how long it actually takes to have a glycogen repletion after training. And uh, the first uh, graph here, you can see that after 24 hours, the glycogen concentration was replenished. But in this study of Nakatani, it was endurance, light exercise that actually was performed by the athletes. So the glycogen uh, repletion in trained athletes 
was complete after 24 hours after an endurance training. For example, a marathon, which I know is a very um, strenuous exercise type, there it takes even more than two days before glycogen has been restored. Um, this is a long table, but I just wanted to highlight the, the green circles that uh, in this study, it has been seen that if you have high, up to very high exercise intensities, you need to adjust your nutrition with carbohydrate uh, uh, ingestion, especially two to six hours after exercise. And then you, uh, it still takes 24 to 36 hours before glycogen repletion uh, um, has been fulfilled in the muscle. So we need to take that into account because what happens otherwise is that you train, sometimes, for example, have an intense training, your glycogen content has not been replenished, but you train again, and so it goes downwards. So at a certain point, you need to give a proper recovery um, uh, in your training schedule, because if this goes downward, that is one of the um, explanations why you have a contractile dysfunction after a while, and why, for example, dysfunctional overreaching and overtraining can be um, um, the, the final result of bad training. Of course, I want to um, admit and highlight that nutrition is very important. So in the ideal circumstance, there is a, a coach, there is an exercise physiologist, and there's a nutritionist that sit together and actually uh, look at this um, to look at this very individually per athlete and also adjust the nutritional habits to the training habits in certain weeks. Then, of course, we need to match this uh, glycogen, um, like the, the, the fact that we uh, consume glycogen during certain types of, tri of training, glycogen resynthesis, to what types of training or training model we actually um, carry out with the athlete we are supervising or coaching. And historically, you have two types of training that have been put forward, and those are the polarized versus the threshold training, where you can see in the threshold training that most of the training frequency is happening between the lactate thresholds or around the lactate thresholds. While polarized training model, you can see there's a high amount of training uh, in the endurance zone or the low uh, intensity zone. Actually, there's a very low amount of training in between uh, the thresholds, and then you have the interval trainings that are happening at a quite high intensity in your training schedule. So the polarized training model versus the lactate tra uh, threshold training model, um, it has been observed quite frequently now that um, polarized training is actually superior to lactate threshold training. So um, lactate threshold training is the training that I explained before that actually um, eats and consumes glycogen at a very high rate. While polarized training is, in my opinion, very important because the low, slow endurance trainings uh, and are very important for athletes. And then you need to couple that to very specific interval trainings. And if you think this is only in endurance athletes, it's not true. For example, in this study, it was uh, like the two training models were compared in um, top level speed skaters. And even there, the group that trained in a polarized training model had better results after the training than compared to the group that had the lactate threshold model. So um, I think this could be combined to the fact that threshold training and glycogen resynthesis um, needs to be uh, seen and viewed in combination with each other. So if you have multiple day of threshold training per week, like it was proposed in the lactate threshold uh, uh, model, training model, then it, like, it actually takes quite a while before you, you can do two threshold trainings after each other, actually three days uh, uh, before your glycogen amount has re resynthesized completely. So, and that is exactly the reason why I think that um, if something has gone wrong with athletes, it has to do with the fact that their training schedule was too intense. 
And that is something I want to, to, to talk to you about from my experience is um, when athletes sometimes uh, gave me their training schedule of the year before, I think that was absolutely crazy. Sometimes um, they had five interval trainings per week, one endurance training uh, of three hours, and that was it. So um, um, I must say, I was sometimes very disappointed um, in how uh, young athletes, young promising, promising cyclists were supervised before they, 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 they knocked at my door or from colleagues that also uh, supervise or coach athletes in a very good and proper way. Uh, it's, it's very difficult in, in, in the world of cycling, I believe, uh, because sometimes ex-cyclists who have their own experience, who had a good career uh, and who trained in a certain way that worked for them, um, become a coach and they actually start coaching young athletes. And that is sometimes uh, where it starts to go wrong because those young athletes are not up for the job and are um, like coached in, in a too intense way with a lot of interval trainings, with uh, uh, long trainings, no respect for recovery periods and so on and so on. And uh, that is something I, I have experienced so many times the last few years. And um, yeah, that is something I, I would like to to, um, to give you a sort of a, a, an insight from, from a cyclist per perspective. Um, and one of my cyclists um, I now coach for one year is Morne. And actually last uh, weekend, he got his first uh, uh, pro tour podium. So I'm quite proud of him. He is a South African national from Pretoria and he was a youth track champion. And actually for him, it was also quite an adventure because he moved to France, he moved to Europe to build out his cycling career. And last year, um, I remember well, um, I got a phone from him and um, yeah, he asked me to, to coach him and we, I knew him via, via a friend we have in common. And yeah, I started asking some questions and he, he was very emotional and he said he was completely um, like he lost the weight completely in his career. And I um, throughout the first few months, we called a lot. Uh, uh, we, we spoke a lot with each other. Um, I, I tried to follow him up quite closely, but um, he started to, to, to mention that he was overtrained only after a few months himself, when he started feeling very strong, very good, and, and, and also in a mental way, very stable. And one of the things I experienced so far is that those cyclists actually start to hate their own training. And one thing that is for me that is very obvious now is the, the one thing they have to learn again is um, their passion for cycling or for the sport they are doing. They are losing that completely when they are overreached or, or, or overtrained. So there's a big mental um, and psychological uh, issue about overtraining. And one of the things that you can see, one of the signs you can see is when they are not overtrained or not overreached anymore, they completely love their job. They go cycling they, they, for six, five to six hours, they drink a coffee, uh, they call you in the evening and they say, wow, I love my life. And that is completely the other, the opposite side when they, these guys are overtrained. They are not happy, uh, they feel very fatigued uh, and, and, and then you know something is wrong. So a close monitoring of athletes in terms of rate of perceived exertion, in terms of speaking to those guys, in terms of uh, looking into heart rates uh, um, uh, and, and power output ratios. And all those things are very important, I think, when you are working with athletes and it takes, a, a, of course, a lot of effort. I, I think I, I hear my athletes every week, but I think it's very important if, if you want to do the job right. So people who have 50 athletes, maybe it's a bit too much because I don't think you can build out such a relationship with 50 athletes. Um, I think, um, Robin, um, it's time for the video to finally um, keep my mouth shut and let uh, Morne speak a little bit. And I'm a Hello, my name is Monet van uh, I come from South Africa, Pretoria, and I'm a cyclist for the pro team 
Saint Michel, Aubert, uh, Cotter, and Prez, um, a French team that's been professional since uh, 26, 27 years. Um, this is now my third year in the team, and it's my fourth season in France. Um, I started coming, um, uh, I moved to France in 2018 to try and uh, can make it uh, to get a professional contract, in which I was lucky enough to do at the end of 2018. And today I'm coached by Bert Silly and um, I started uh, training with him in August 2020, 2020, yeah. And um, our, well, our um, relationship, training relationship started a bit complicated as the very first thing um, I had to do was to take uh, 10 days off the bike due to um, uh, over fatigue, over fatigue, uh, over training. Um, of course, by overtraining, um, I had terrible inflammation on the psoas muscles where I had birth seats, uh, as the, the French called it. Um, and now today, um, I'm here to talk a bit about, uh, or making this video to talk about uh, a bit of the feelings that I had uh, through the overtraining. And yeah, it's, um, it started a bit... Uh, Every year it's got a little bit worse of just going a little bit deeper every single time into overtraining. Um, of it's actually a big thing of feeling guilty of not of wanting to do more and um, searching to do more. And every single time, obviously you're going deeper and deeper into your red zone and um, getting more and more tired. And with that, the sensations are going getting worse in races, which means you feel. Um, obliged to go train even more when you get home. So every single time you're going deeper and deeper into that um, fatigue and it's just a vicious cycle and uh, losing confidence in your ability and then what you're able to do and then just your performance going backwards very quickly. Um, never having energy, never wanting to do anything. And then with that also I've picked up weight a lot of weight with due to this while doing a lot of faster, long, faster rides to try and lose weight and eventually having the, the opposite effect. Um, and then also doing lots of intervals, really, really lots of high intensity intervals, which also eventually made me not enjoy what I was doing so much. Um, I just did not feel get wake up in the mornings and actually want to go ride. Whereas since we changed that, um, I actually look forward to my intervals during the week. Since I don't do a lot, um, not that often keep, uh, to keep the legs and the body and mind fresh for racing on the weekends. And with that also, my team has said how they have, um, they are really impressed with the change um, in physical and mental performance throughout the season of just taking it down a notch with intensity and putting in long um, endurance rides and with one or two um, interval sessions a week. And myself personally, mentally, it's been going a lot better. I love cycling again. I can't wait to, to get on my bike and to go ride. Um, I was I was at the point where almost I thought about stopping cycling because it was just it was just not working. I was trying very hard. I was dieting, trying to lose weight and everything. And now um, it's just after actually taking a step back in um, like the sensation of uh, the, uh, perceived exertion. Um, actually started getting better. My performance on the bike is better. My um, personal life is better. Um, I actually had to go to a um, sports psychiatrist to try and help get everything sorted again in my mind because I was just 
not at a good state, not happy where I was at, not happy with my performance um, and just not just struggling in a day-to-day -day life. And now actually I feel good. I feel uh, free, um, with big weight off the shoulders and really, really enjoying cycling again. And actually um, Sunday, the 18th of uh, July, I got my first professional podium and um, I'm very, very happy uh, where I am at the moment in the training. And my performance has actually gone up, as I said, um, uh, uh, me, my mental strength and my weight has gotten, everything has gotten better after taking actually a step back in training and not trying to overtrain. And I think if today I can say anything to a young rider or anyone, it's just, it's not to feel guilty to say Um, Marcelo, Jorette, can you confirm if the video has stopped? I think there was a problem with the video, but okay. I think, uh, why don't you continue or carry on with your presentation and finish off? Yeah, okay, wonderful. So, um, dear people, um, the, the, the last thing Morne wanted to say, I think, was um, that um, he wanted to advise young riders uh, to um, not feel guilty uh, when you train uh, a, a less. Uh, I think that, that was, that was his, his last point he wanted to make, that get the feeling of guilt uh, uh, was actually one of the basic things that he was struggling with during his, his period of overtraining. And, and, and uh, just to go on uh, on this before sharing my screen again, um, if he says uh, that the training was less than, uh, from a coach's perspective, the training was actually in terms of volume a lot more. Um, in terms of volume, um, he had to do a lot of endurance training, a lot of endurance stimuli, but the, the amount of intense uh, training, intensive interval trainings, that have, has decreased a lot uh, in his training schedule. Uh, and I must say, it's a pleasure now uh, being a coach of Morning because he's very grateful, but as you can see, it's a lot to go through as an athlete. You have the mental aspect. Uh, he went. To, he wanted to go to a sport psychiatrist. Um, he also has the nutritional uh, problems where he spoke about. And that is one one thing I, I, I really want to 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 share with you before uh, concluding this presentation. Um, I think you can see my screen again now. Um, if uh, you can do your thumbs up, Marcel, if you can see my screen again, wonderful. Uh, so. Um, one of the things that uh, was from quite remarkable for me, and that is something I would like to, to also maybe also have your opinion about, is so when he had his stressful training with predominant glycogen glucose metabolism in his previous training schedule before uh, um, knocking at my door, what he actually had was shorter trainings, not a lot of long endurance trainings, uh, less fat metabolism because there were a lot of intense training. It was actually sort of a polarized, uh, sorry, a sort of a lactate threshold model of training. But he actually had a lot of weight gain. And I think um, his weight, we, I tried to, to um, derive his focus from his weight. And I just included some split half trainings with some sober trainings in the morning, two hours, then breakfast, and then another endurance training in the afternoon. And his weight ha has come down automatically with nine kilograms without even uh, putting him on a diet. So uh, uh, without focusing on it, uh, uh, feeling mentally guilty about it, uh, it just went down automatically because of the longer trainings and more fat burning during endurance interval. 
uh, sorry, endurance training. So that was quite remarkable for me that feeling guilty um, actually uh, was an implication for him to uh, include fasting periods. And he, so he started fasting. He, he started adjusting his, his diet, uh, um, reducing carbohydrates while he actually needed or those carbohydrates, in, especially in that training model, because he had, of course, worse glycogen levels during that training regimen. So that was quite like crazy. And of course, then you, you come into sort of a, a catabolic um, muscle state where your immune system disbalance, HPA disbalance, and neurotransmission neurotrans dysfunction could maybe be uh, a, a consequence of the, the lack of glycogen restoration. And um, so in this case, we were able to, to turn the cycle back up. And if he says he was off the bike for 10 days, that is true, but he was actually off the bike for three months. Uh, I put him back on a bike, uh, um, constant recovery uh, rides, because otherwise, uh, uh, mentally, it was very difficult for him because uh, I think he was thinking about stopping of being a cyclist. So I, I, I got him back on the bike, but um, like it was a frequency of three trainings a week and just recovery average. Uh, so he was, he says he was off the bike for 10 days, like really off the bike. But for me, we, we started building again after two or three months when all the, the markers or indirect markers were good again to, uh, to start the training. Um, so the, for me, the take home message is actually to have a close monitoring of athletes. Um, that is very important. And I know uh, in the big teams, in the professional teams, that is absolutely no problem. I think there's a, a good budget for, for, for a good um, like structure uh, for athletes. But it is especially in those layers below the top teams that have lower budgets, uh, um, youngsters, promising elite cyclists, uh, that can be the future of cycling. There, I think uh, it's still a big problem. Um, a third problem we, we are facing is um, um, like a, another Belgian colleague from Brussels, Romain Mason, uh, has developed a sort of an overtraining protocol. Uh, um, so you're, uh, you're most welcome to, to look that up, but it's still very difficult to uh, diagnose overtraining. You, you have some indirect markers, so you just need to to uh, focus and to to like to monitor your athlete very very close for that, and then uh, a polarized training model is according to me superior to the threshold training and also according to to quite some manuscripts so far, and for me also one of the problems is sometimes ex cyclist coaches I, I don't have anything against ex cyclists but I have if they coach. Um, cyclists promising athletes without any training uh, into exercise physiology or training sciences, because then I think uh, in some cases it's really a recipe for disaster. And to conclude with some last experience is I had ex-cyclists that were uh, coach for a, a team of youngsters um, that was taking some things to to uh, on a training stage, on a training camp, to to beat the youngsters uh, on a, on a certain training. So sometimes um, uh, the situation is, I think, according to me, very bad, uh, and I, I think it's it's worth to 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 think about this and also to to discuss with all of you. So uh, from Belgium, thank you very very much for listening, and also thank you very much for the invitation to be able to talk about it, this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bat. Um, I think Jared and Marcel are gonna take over the Q&A now. Um, if you, by any chance, have that link for the overtraining protocol or guideline, you can always pop it in the Q&A, but otherwise I'm sure people can look it up. Um, and then, yeah, if you can also just thank your cyclist from us, uh, Monet Fanika, for his um, providing us with that video. But yeah, over to Jared and Marcel. But uh, thanks so much. That was that was fantastic, um, and I think it's a topic that's really, really important. It's, it's something that we we see so often, um, you know, in this in the sports medicine clinic, um, and a lot of the time the athlete themselves is not even considering the possibility of overtraining, um, because all they're seeing really is that you know they're training harder, they they're eating less, but they're getting getting slower. Um, 
and one of the biggest challenges is is trying to to get that message through um, and it's often quite a long consultation sort of discussing all the factors going through their uh, their dietary history their training history um, all of their symptoms and then really uh, starting to slowly sort of introduce the possibility that they they may be overtraining or, or, or overreaching um, and you know as you said making a diagnosis is 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 difficult uh, but actually uh, getting them to buy into uh, buy into the diagnosis and make those changes is um, is even more difficult sometimes um, have you found any success in you know maybe using a sort of some sort of data driven approach in terms of sh showing them uh, certain numbers to be able to convince them that that they may be uh, you know flirting with overtraining Well, that's a good question. Thank you for that, Jared. Um, uh, for me, um, RP is very important because it has been um, observed in literature that RP is, uh, has a close correlation with lactate threshold. After every training, I try to, to ask to rate the training, um, what they felt, what they looked like uh, on the training. Um, and then I also try to monitor combined with the heart rate um, um, ratio on the power and for example, if they have an endurance training in their zone where their heart rate would have been increased during endurance or decreased during interval trainings, that's for me first marker to look further mm. uh, and, and, and give the, the, the athlete a call. Okay, what's wrong? Um, yesterday, maybe a difficult day. Um, maybe, for example, I can, can give you quite a, a recent example of Mornay. He had um, something happening in his family without um, uh, saying something about that because it's quite private, but it was quite intense. And I just saw on his training parameters like, oof, um, RPE is quite high for that training. Nothing is wrong with the heart rate. So I called him and then he started talking about what happened. And um, for me, that is also an indication of the fact that we have to, to look at the, uh, the health of the athlete in a very broad sense. So we have the physiological markers, we have the psychological markers, and we actually also have the social markers because for example, in teams, you also have a lot of competition going on. Uh, you have a lot of uh, um, uh, cyclists that don't want to, to ride for that guy and that guy going on. So there's a lot of broad stress on uh, uh, athletes. And I think um, as, for me as a coach, I try to see it also in a very broad sense. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's a correct response to what you... Oh, uh, yeah. Good advice. No, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple of um, questions from the audience. Maybe we can get through those quickly. Um, so Omar asked, um, on cardiopulmonary exercise testing, what percentage of VO2 max do you tend to see uh, for anaerobic threshold? And do, do you use the, the anaerobic threshold value for improving their training? That's a very good question. Um, when, when I... Um... What I think is a good marker as well uh, is that um, overtrained athletes um, are most of the time um, not getting to a lactate value at the end of their exercise test uh, above eight to nine millimole per liter. And I think that is uh, when you speak about uh, an, an anaerobic indi indication, I uh, always look at the maximum lactate value. Of course, I know that endurance athletes um, uh, most of the time uh, don't have a very high maximal lactate value at the end of an exercise test when they go all out. But if that is below eight to nine, for me, it's also sort of an indication. Sure. Marcel, you wanted to ask something? You muted Marcel. I said, no, it's fun. I'm happy with Bert. Bert's also there. Oh, okay. Uh, then Devin, uh, Devin Main, uh, a, uh, a local sort of top level cyclist himself. Um, he's, he's doing some coaching and he's got an interesting question about the difference between uh, heart rate when cycling and heart rate when running. So he says he's noticed with a couple of his athletes um, when adding running to a cyclist program, he finds that their, uh, their resting, that their heart rates uh, decrease. So their max heart rate uh, drops. 
um, by around 10 beats per minute. Um, any idea on you know the differences between uh, heart rate running and heart rate cycling? Devin, thank you for, for this question. Uh, that's actually quite interesting because um, I'll try to include, especially in the winter period, multi-sports to cyclists because uh, um, I think we all know that, um, for example, uh, for triathletes, but also for cyclists, running is even more cardiovascular challenging. And that is why you have more effects on the cardiovascular system and, and cyclists as well. So I can believe that if you do it regularly and you put it in the training schedule of cyclists, that um, their heart rate will might have been impacted by the running as well. So uh, I'm, I'm an absolute supporter of multi-sports also in cycling and especially in the winter preparation. The only thing I think you need to take, to, to, uh, you need to take into account is the fact because um, the cyclists are not used to have the impact sports um, that um, you have to do it, your build up very slowly because um, of course, their body is not prepared for uh, high impact running. And I think sometimes I, I, I've, I've seen cyclists where I try to do multi sports in winter times. And I also didn't do it after a few weeks because the sense like they were quite sensitive for for injuries. So uh, then we just uh, we just discussed it and, and, and removed it from the schedule. But it's a very good remark. Yeah. Um, then Prof. Krista um, has uh, asked about, she's acknowledged that overtraining syndrome is obviously a very complicated. Um, and she's asking about specific markers um, in terms of monitoring or, or, or diagnosing overtraining yeah. system uh, syndrome. So um, I suppose more on the clinical side. I, I can answer uh, that one, Joe. Go for it. Thanks for the question, Prof. Krista. Um, yeah, as, um, as Bert alluded to previously, um, and uh, what we know, there's no definitive um, diagnostic markers for overtraining syndrome. So we really have to look broader and wider, and we know it has multiple uh, manifestations in different organ systems, um, including one of our main ones is psych uh, psychological uh, aspects that it affects us. So I think a very easy way of monitoring our athletes um, is by doing certain, having certain outcome measures in terms of um, profile of mood states, for example, or you get something called a training distress score or our rest cue questionnaire. These are all types of questionnaires which um, if an athlete is, is suffering, starting to suffer from, from overtraining syndrome, you will start to manifest uh, some psychological um, symptoms. And this is a very easy way of, of uh, I think, identifying these and identifying these easy, easy and early enough to rather prevent overtraining syndrome because we know how, how difficult it is to treat it. Another thing I think which Bert mentioned is um, I think a simple way of introducing RPE um, scoring or, or, or grading in uh, after our training sessions because we know there's um, a discrepancy develops between our subjective measures like RPE and our objective measures like heart rate or what, um, when we do get closer to that line of, of overtraining syndrome. So that is also something that we can very easily implement into our monitoring, um, and which should flag um, any suspicion of, of uh, us flirting with the line of overtraining syndrome. And then, I mean, looking at our other... No, I mean yeah, sorry, Joe, just to finish off on other manifestations, we know our, our, our dietary or our caloric um, requirements that you need. If we see a rider starting to lose weight or he's gaining weight without other explainable causes for that, or, um, or, or yeah, it's, it's another, another way of just being, being aware or flagging that, uh, that we could be getting close to that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly echo uh, what, what you said. And um, I think often athletes come looking for uh, a magic uh, blood test or something that you can do and, and tell them definitively, you know, do I have an overtraining syndrome? Um, and, and as you said, you know, there really isn't any uh, smoking gun. I do think a, a battery of bloods is probably still worthwhile because, you, you know, sometimes you do pick up a couple of things that can sort of 
push you in that direction. Um, you know, there, there might be hormonal changes. There might be, you know, HB, which is heading down. There might be, you know, white cell count changes, but none of these on their own are, are really enough to, to, to make the diagnosis. But um, in terms of other objective measures, I mean, there's been a lot of research in terms of heart rate variability and a couple of other things. But any experience there with heart rate variability? What do you think? Yeah, our variability um, has been observed to, to, to be disturbed, uh, as I said, because of the para and orthosympathetic disturbances. Uh, but the, like, um, I, I think I answered to you, to you, Prof. Krista, as well. Uh, I just included for people who are interested the, the reference of the two bout protocol to diagnose overtraining, uh, what they tried to do in the group in Brussels with Roman Mason. It was published in Sports Medicine. But it's it's based upon the, the the hormones they actually measure in a two bout protocol and compare it with each other. But it's of course quite difficult, and uh, there's a lot of laboratory testing needed to 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 determine that. So um, as a coach and, and and like exercise physiologist, I try to first discover some indirect markers be before. Like there was one cyclist I sent to to Brussels to to do the test because I was not sure. Uh, and heart rate variability is sort of an indication of the disturbances between the ortho and parasympathetic activities and can be used, but it's still it's still yeah it's still inconclusive um, uh, together with the with the the the, the increased submaximal and the decreased maximal heart rate combined with the maximal lactate steady state uh, all those markers are, can be a, a bit of the puzzle and then you can start thinking about overtraining and maybe sending them to 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 a lab where they try to to assess that. Yeah. The other problem with that two-stage test is that it involves, you know, two exhaustive uh, exercise sessions, you know, yeah, on exactly. consecutive days. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very difficult test yeah. to do. So practically, it's probably not used all that much outside of, you know, the, the professionals. Yeah. Um, That's very correct, yeah. Um, what other questions do we have here? Um, an anonymous attendee has asked whether there's any merits in assessing cardiac ejection fraction in assessing overtraining. I must say, I don't, I don't really have an answer there. Marcel, how's your cardiology? Uh, I, I, I can't say that I've ever come across a, an article <laughs> where, they've, um, where they've explored the relationship between uh, ejection fraction on echo and overtraining syndrome. Okay, so we'll, we'll give that one a, an I don't know. Um, then um, Krista again has, has asked, um, how do we distinguish between overtraining syndrome and so-called chronic fatigue syndrome? Um, Marcel, maybe you can help us there. That's a great one to pass on to me, isn't it, Jared? Um, <laughs> Hospital pass. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, thanks, Prof. Krista, um, for coming with your, your brilliant questions. Um, you know, do we know? Is it on a continuum? Uh, do, do we have a, a specific defined diagnostic criteria? We, we probably don't. So I don't, um, I'm not convinced that there's a way of distinguishing between the two. And because there's such an overlap between the both of them, and as we know, recent publications have, have started to um, also a question of, is there an overlap between overtraining syndrome and radius? Um, there is, I mean, because it's such a multi-organ system and hormonal response, maladaptive response, there, there must be an overlap. Um, and I'm not quite convinced that we can, you know, uh, strict define uh, uh, the difference between the two. Marcel, there's a career for you in politics if, you, if you're interested. I was answered like a true politician, but um, I absolutely agree with you and that there's probably some sort of overlap or continuum, um, but whether we can tell the two apart, you know, I, I don't think that's, that's a very easy thing to do. Um, Omar's got a nice question. He's, it's obviously something that comes up pretty often and I think Bert should be able to help us here. Um, the question on, you know, keto diets and low carb diets. And, you know, there is it really possible for, for someone who's training for cycling to, to perform well on, on these diets? And what would your advice be to, to an athlete who, who was, you know, wanting to give one of these uh, diets a go? Mm -hmm. 
Well, interesting uh, question. Like the ketone, uh, the ketones, they, they are a hot topic right now. Jared, you're probably aware. <laughs> but uh, um, um, the ketones are actually used to um, inhibit uh, glycolytic activity. So the carbohydrate uh, um, metabolism is actually inhibited by the, the ketones. And that's why they are used because um, when the athlete is ingesting ketones, uh, during a race, for example, um, the, the moment when uh, carbohydrates are being consumed or converted for energy is being postponed. So that is, that is, that is the big effect of ketones. A low carb diet in, um, in athletes, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't think that, that is a good idea, uh, honestly, because um, especially when you give an interval training, um, you need to have carbs to, to replenish your, your glycogen. But of course, like what I did with Mornay, what he said as well, we got his weight down uh, to, to give very specific training stimuli uh, sober. And then it was very easy, slow ride. And then you can do it, of course. Um, th then you can perfectly do it because you try to stimulate uh, free fatty acid consumption. Um, also, I let him drink one coffee without sugar before he started his first two hours training because caffeine is well known to activate uh, uh, fat burning. Uh, so that is what he did. And actually after five weeks, he felt perfectly healthy. He felt very strong and his weight got down with uh, six to seven kilograms. Just uh, by um, doing um, no low carb diet, but just sober training. So endurance training, two hours split half, and then the afternoon, the second training, endurance. So in my opinion, that is a good option and a better option than a low carb diet, if that answers your question. I suppose what you're alluding to really is um, periodizing the nutrition, just as you might periodize you know, nutrition, you, you try and match the, uh, the, the nutrition to the to the training, um, but yeah, I, I'd agree with you, and I can tell you that there's there's no one in the pro peloton is on a, a pure you know keto diet. So I, I think that pretty much answers it. And the you know the amateur athletes that we see all the time, um, you know maybe if they're doing very much ultra endurance type events where they're just sitting in zone one and two for extended periods, maybe that's an option. But in, in cycling, mountain biking, uh, races where, you know, the, 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 there's high intensity efforts required. I think uh, these guys often struggle. Um, then uh, one I wanted to, to ask you, uh, Bert, is that um, there's, you know, there's plenty of evidence that, that the, the uh, polarized training model is, is superior. Um, one of the pushbacks against uh, this type of training is that it, it only works for, for athletes doing very high volumes. So what about the athletes, the amateur athlete who's, who's only got six hours a week to train? Should they still be doing polarized training or should they be incorporating more, uh, you know, high intensity intervals or, or, or a threshold model? It's a very good question, Jared, because um, people who like sports or people who like doing sports and have less training time, they like to do it in, in an intense way in some way or another because they have more energy left to do that. But I would recommend to include high intensity interval training with very short bursts because um, if you see the, the cardiovascular effects of high intensity interval training with short bursts, actually uh, you, you can see that there's not too much uh, consumption of your carbohydrates and it's actually a sort of a hidden uh, um, endurance training. So when I um, advise people to that doesn't that don't have that much time uh, to to do the long volume rides or, or runs, uh, the high intensity interval training, in my opinion, is a very good alternative with intervals lower than 20 seconds. Because what what you actually see it's your phosphagen system that is completely depleted in the intervals and the four minutes in between when you actually recover uh, it's the mitochondria that um, aerobically replenish the creatine kinase uh, and the phosphagen system so in, in my opinion i would then go for a good and optimal balance between high intensity interval training one long training and then also like one normal interval training where you also um, um, do some intervals in between your your thresholds something like that. 
Um, another one, um, I'm not sure, I'm sure you're watching the tour, but I don't know if you uh, were watching the alt tour, which was a uh, bit of a publicity stunt uh, done by a writer called Lachlan Morton, who I've worked with previously at, at Dimension Data. Uh, he's an EF Pro Cycling rider, and he chose to to ride the Tour de France old school, so pretty much like they did, as you as you were saying in your presentation back in the day. And he rode, you know, the, the whole of the the 2021 route, but he included all the transfers. He slipped under the stars, um, and he had minimal support. He rode half of it in uh, sandals, and um, you know, he he beat the peloton to to Paris by five days. <laughs> Uh, covering 5,500 kilometers. I mean, it's an absolutely, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to imagine that, that type of uh, suffering and endurance. He's also previously held the, the record for, for Everesting, which is where you climb the same climb until you've accumulated the, the sense of Everest. So, I mean, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is there some sort of, is there something special that makes some people better at um, handling training load and, and so be, being able to, to recover faster? Is it just that, is this trainable or is it something that you're sort of born with and that's why these guys are, are pros? Yeah, I think it, it was Australian rider, but I, I can't remember from which team because I, I was also very surprised by the fact that his team allowed him to do that, <laughs> actually, because he's a professional <laughs> rider. I think, uh, I don't know, Jared, yeah. but if someone from UAE uh, wants to do that, I don't think you guys would allow that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but to yeah, answer, he's yeah. got a, a pretty lenient contract. <laughs> yeah, but to answer your question, sometimes you have sort of um, extraordinary athletes in terms of genetics um, and um, I don't think this is something everybody is up to to try like I think um, so, uh, this they, they say it's 60 to 70 percent genetic and 30 to 40 percent trainable in terms of uh, muscle fiber type in terms of uh, um, also for example you, you have you have had some runners that it crazy runs uh, uh, marathons every day during a year, then you also need to have a good uh, uh, bone density and so on. So I think we are speaking about extraordinary people, sort of, of, of physiological mutants that um, maybe yeah, normal people will never reach. I think this performance has been absolutely crazy and stunning because uh, yeah, it's, it, yeah, I cannot believe it actually um, uh, to, to do it that way. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Yeah. Marcel, any other questions or, or comments from your side? Jared, I think um, just to end off, I just want to highlight the fact that you know, when we think of overtraining syndrome, we think of we get it because we train too hard. Um, it's not just that simple, you know. Um, often people look at it as it's, it's rather under recovering syndrome, um, but it's not just that either, you know. There's, there are independent factors which contribute to the development of overtraining syndrome, and those include uh, a reduced caloric intake, you know, low energy availability, uh, poor sleep quality, and social stresses even. And um, that's why the, the diagnosis of overtraining syndrome is never a simple one, and it should always remain a diagnosis of exclusion because there are such a host of different factors that contribute it that we should always exclude other diagnoses or other things that are contributing to the overall uh, maladaptation that's happening to the health of this uh, athlete or rider. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple of people asking whether you'll you'll make your slides available. Will you will you do that for us, and we can we can publish them on the on the Wish website. Yeah. No. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Perfect. That'd be great. Anything else from your side, Bert? Um, oh yeah, I, I, um, I had a, um, another question um, to you, Jared, um, uh, about the team. Oh. Uh, are, are cyclists in, in your team doing strength training? That's something that uh, interests me. Uh... Yeah, so uh, I'm not actually involved with, uh, with UAE anymore. I was, I was there oh, last year, okay. um, but obviously I've, I've had a bit of a history in, in the pro peloton. But, yeah, it's um, it's something that is catching on uh, only recently, really. So you know, when I first started, it was quite rare to have 
have um, athletes doing much strength training, but I know from uh, within UAE that, that it started uh, to become once the, the new uh, performance team was brought in, it became sort of standard and there were, uh, there was strength training uh, prescribed. Um, the strength training mostly takes place uh, during the preseason period, you know. Um, so when the guys are doing their, their base phases and they're doing a lot of zone two stuff, that's when they'll do most of their strength training. And then during the season, um, they shift to more of a maintenance uh, type program. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that has has been brought in and it's becoming more and more common, you know, amongst the, the pro peloton. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas previously it was believed that, you know, you, you, you strength train on the bike. So, you know, you pick your hardest gear and you, you climb up afterwards, you know, but um, it's been recognized now that that's not quite the same. And, and, and that specific strength training is, is beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. And yeah, I think you guys, this question is great. Um, so we just. But thanks again. Thanks very much. That was excellent. I hope you can enjoy some of the Belgian day still. We're just going to be sharing the next webinar, which is going to be coming up next week, Wednesday.